down there to the yeah. We are here for a pre session to talk about gun safety laws. Um, we want to go around this table and just introduce ourselves. Um, who I start with Susie? Okay. Um, I'm Council Member Susie Goldberg. Member Tim A. Rodriguez. Uh, Ted Waters. Harold Bean is city manager. Zach Hart is the city alum. So thanks again, everybody. I just want to make a statement before we get started uh, for all the emails and uh, phone messages that we all got is that this uh, session is not to discuss how to take away your second amendment rights. Um, it is about gun safety protecting our uh, residents and children from, uh, and how we can do that. With the passage of SB 256, um, it was first to its kind repeal of Colorado's rest restricted firearm preemption law. Localities are free to take actions that can help prevent gun violence and make their communities safe. So that's what this is all about. Um, and some of the topics that we're going to discuss are um, open carry, assault, assault rifles, signing, cooling off period, background checks, uh, minimum age to possess firearms, serial numbers are required, um, and prohibition of ghost guns. Um, so can we, as council, maybe tick these off one-on-one -on -one or make a statement about what you're here to do and what you would like to see going forward. So, um, yeah, Council Warren. Yeah, um, I'd like to make a statement, which is that I think the state legislature has done the municipalities a tremendous disservice. Uh, I usually am for local control, but it's totally inappropriate when it comes to firearms because there are very few things that uh, a municipality can do that would be effective or enforceable with regard to uh, firearm safety or control. Um, for example, starting from city center, there are there are six gun stores within a ten mile radius uh, of here, and three of them are in Longmont, where any statute we passed would would affect them. And the other three are in Will County, where no statute passed by, passed by the county will ever affect them in our lifetimes. So, uh, you know, anything that we would do to restrict, for example, the sale of a class of weapons, um, we have no impact other than if you consider the requirement to to drive two miles or ten miles to squad seven instead of two miles to grandpa's, you know, if, if that extra eight minutes is your cooling off period, then that's what we can do about a cooling off period. Um, so I don't think that class of weapon bans make any sense. I don't think the race of the age makes any sense because it's going to be lower across the county line. Um, most of these things don't make any sense. The only, the only one that I think could be potentially enforceable, and I you know, wish to have a longer conversation with a law enforcement organization about it, um, but I think that open carry in at least certain public places is something that we could deal with. We already have limited open carry prohibitions on some of the city buildings, and that could be expanded and I would like to have a discussion with um, our law enforcement people about what it would take to do that. It's also the only one that I could see that would make the city safer. Okay, and um, we'll just make a list of things that we would want uh, our public safety chief, Zach Artis, to address. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Tim, do you have <coughs> any statements? Like, well, came into this I think I need to stay less and listen more. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe what I'll, where I'll start is this. The two documents in front of me that I was able to represent earlier conversations about uh, 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 the, the first, or what, what came first in terms of chronology, 
is this report that was uh, presented to the council on, on January 28, 2018. Mm -hmm. It's the report uh, following an event that we hosted in the fall of 2018. And some of the people in this room, many of the people in this room were involved in the World Cafe conversation. Uh, it was the first time in my experience that I've seen people along the continuum of Second Amendment advocates or Rally for Our Rights folks to Moms Demand Action sitting at a table listening to them, which was encouraging. Uh, the follow-on to that was an action planning session where there were actually groups, some here and some I know who are in the next group, who actually uh, leaned in to do action planning to turn uh, a set of conclusions into, into action plans. Gotta get pumped up. Gotta be on the run. Um, for me, the whole purpose of what we did with this was to try to make a difference. It was at the same time that Boulder went through their initial approval of their ordinance on the salt weapons. And at the time, that was part of Zach's tenure. I, you know, I asked Mike Butler for his reaction, and Mike's comment was, um, you know, what they're doing is making a statement that's not going to make a difference, what, what Boulder had done at that time. Um, you know, he, he went on, and I've talked to Mike about this since. Um, that in Longmont, the, the, the people who are at greatest risk of gun violence are people with whom they live. Uh, it's what happens in domestic situations. I'm not, and I'm not understating the horror that we've seen in the country because what what followed on to this was this resolution, right? I want to make a distinction. This was an attempt in my mind uh, to try to move us in the direction of making a difference that would result in health and safety of Longmont, with regards of age. Which I did not think then, and I'm, and I'm not certain today. I, mean, I, I, I share a lot of Marsha's perspective here. Um, that no matter what we do with regulate with regulations, and I'm willing to, to consider whatever we want to put on the table, and, and I'll vote my conscience on you know on those. But at the end of the day, no matter what we do, I think we're going to be in the same pattern that the other municipalities have, have been, and that is to be making statements, not differences, unless we also commit ourselves. The work that has to be done to change the culture in this community, at least. We can't change it in any other municipality. And we might have a minimum impact in all of But if we only adopt ordinances and we don't commit to engaging with our gun dealers, our advocates, uh, moms to men, actually everybody in this town who cares about this issue, then I think we will have failed to meet our obligation to the community in terms of health and safety. Okay, thank you. I didn't think we were on the five minute. We're not, we're not. We're not. Because this didn't get the legs that I hoped that it would. There were some groups that came together around this, who provided a template for action planning, who was actually met several times, but it lost steam. And I'm not surprised at that. We, those of us who were involved in helping to plan this, said we're not going to take the, we're not going to carry the burden of facilitating the action planning. The community has to own this. And so it's not surprising, I suppose, that it ran out of gas. Fast forward to August of 2019, Thousand Oaks, Dayton, Ohio, El Paso, right? That, that fits the sequence of those three. For me, left me in a position to say, you know, if, if we can't make a difference, at least I, I, I'm willing to lead with my chin to make a statement. So the resolution, right, that we adopted was not an, it wasn't, an, it didn't take any place to come in, right? What we did was recommend as a council, at least four of us, recommended as a council that the state legislature do its job. And we highlighted in the resolution things that were already part of the Colorado statutes, right? And in fact, if you look at it, most of the things that the Colorado legislature had already addressed, right? Red flag laws and universal background checks, et cetera. But it also went to members of Congress, right? In hopes that they would do their job, right? I knew at the time it was just state making, not difference making. But I thought it was worth making a statement that somebody ought to do what you know, what whatever they think is the right thing. So um, I'm not opposed to to doing things that that we think are going to make a difference in health and safety. But if it's just this, or if it's just what the other board, uh, the other municipalities did, my my fear is that we fall short, as I said, about doing our job. So, um, uh, I, I, if we, I think before we 
before we pass any more laws, I'd love to revisit it. Whether it's this set of findings or it's somebody offering a new process, but with the people in this room who care about this and the people in the other room who care about this, that we come together, listen to one another, and answer the question together, what do we have to do to, to, to decrease the risk of gun violence or any kind of violence? One of the findings in that, in that initial report was that we ought to work together to reduce risks of violence across the board. In fact, I think that was probably Rod's comment that night. That could we address that together? And, and we can deal with guns as part of it, but there's a much bigger issue in society. And I'm not, and I'm not letting anybody off the hook here in terms of responsibilities for whatever is, whatever weapons people can use. I just think we ought to take a really thoughtful approach to this uh, because of what other municipalities did. I don't feel like you can follow their lead. And it's not going to lead to greater safety in the long run. That said, I think we ought to embrace whatever is necessary um, that helps us feel like we need the standard that our, our residents expect us to be in terms of addressing their health and safety. Let me ask you this question before we go on. Um, I, I voted for this resolution. So I know you did. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the the whole uh, atmosphere has changed. It's a very different world than it was just four years. Um, looking at this and looking at some of the things that have been proposed, if we did another resolution, for four people voting for that, would you add or detract from any of this? And that's based upon what we see happening to make it stronger? Well, what I, what I, honestly, what I would do, that's a question directly to me. Yes. Yeah, I, I would defer, I would say, look, I'll let, I'll let my chin on both of these. Right. I'd like to listen to somebody else. Okay. Well, I, I think I'm going to agree with Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I, I know that Colorado has a, a bevy uh, of regulations already based on the state legislature. And I think some of those do include the kinds of laws that red flag, red flag laws. And I do believe that there is um, ammunition uh, magazine regulations as well already in place. And that there's some of these things that are already in place in the state legislature. So, what's the point of duplication? Uh, uh, that's just a question I have. And then I think a secondary question that I have is, is relation to enforcement. I mean, what is the reality of enforcement? I don't, enact, I don't like enacting ordinances that are, are not really enforceable. And we have a few that have been hard to enforce here. We can talk about fireworks as an issue. Um, the bicycles that go up and down Main Street is hard to enforce. Uh, smoking on Main Street is hard to enforce. Um, these things are common occurrences to the state. Uh, and so going into something like this, uh, first of all, I do think that low hanging fruit would probably be open here. Because that is somewhat, you know, not every city in Colorado allows for open carry. Um, I think that's a completely different conversation that can see it here. Uh, as far as the appearance of, of safety and, and people's comfort levels and things like that. Yeah, we've seen the folks on Main Street who are open carry. It causes some distress, and I think that does not infringe on people's right to own guns to stop open care. Uh, some of these, I thought we have background checks on the state of Colorado, but probably had, it may not be a 10 day waiting period, but I thought there was a waiting period. The state statute, I could be wrong on that. Is that there's, no, there's no waiting period at all. I don't know, it's like a two day or something. Like that. Okay. So, and then I would like to make sure that I don't believe, is there a legal definition of assault rifle or assault weapon? Uh, I think you need to be more specific as saying semi-automatic rifles or, or you know, and that, that is a very large group of rifles as well. You know? um, so, so being very specific, you know, weapons of war, assault weapons, I think are kind of in terms that are, uh, I don't know if there really is a legal definition for it. Um, I've heard that's problematic as far as some of these ordinances are concerned. So that, that, those are kind of my questions going into this. As, uh, as far as emulating what other cities in Boulder County have done, I think we are also kind of uniquely placed outside of the community with our location spanning Boulder and Love County. And knowing the reality 
that it's very unlikely record fire zone or anything like that, or um, ordinance is much less well county as a pocket itself is very unlikely to do that. I think they declared themselves a second amendment sanctuary uh, at one point in the recent past. And so those are all challenges that one of faces somewhat unique when we're having this conversation. So, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm uh, definitely willing to listen to this conversation and see where we're going to go. Okay, so I am now considering the but I don't think that that unduly infringes on somebody's right to own a, a firearm if they so choose. Yeah, you know, and again, I have more questions. I mean, like, as far as what we can do, and really, what is the reality of what, what is the impact on our public safety by enacting? More regulation of certain types of, you know, looking at some of these for you know, uh, candy for sale or, um, I don't know, uh, different uh, open care. What would be the impact on you all? You know, that's something I would like to know. Is this something that's important? Is this, um, you know, what are the recommendations you have? For, um, so it's so something I am thinking for, you know what I mean? Because I have an extensive background with mental, with mental health. Um, you know, for several years, you know, I had a daughter who survived suicide. I think she had access to that. They actually moved them to my home during the time that she was in crisis. And I think she had access to that. She would be here today. So, you know, that idea of that leaving period, leaving off period, I think it makes a world of difference for individuals in crisis. Um, some of the talk that I've heard around mental illness, you know, some of the emails you know, reference to crises, and well, I feel that takes us back as far as trying to break the stigma of mental, mental health and mental illness. So, you know, just automatically throwing that people who do this, you know, they're crazy or they, you know, they, they have mental illness. No, you know, findings are, are, have shown that about 25% have a diagnosed illness. But there's also another underlying factor. Most people with mental illness do not commit these crimes. They're not homicidal. There's, there's something else going on. Um, so, you know, I think that in some of the findings that were in here, and I don't want to throw this work out the window either, I want to see you know, what happened in that steps. You know, I look at what the next steps said. Was there follow through on that? How's this work? You know, what can we do to get this work continuing? I think I don't want to throw this out and start something new. I want to build off of what the community has, has, you know, what the community has given and what can we do to the meaningful legislation or ordinances. So, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of would like to hear. You know, what, what are some, some things that are can happen? What are some things that are realistic for our community? So I'll let my in for a minute. Um, I think I uh, think the open carry needs to be addressed uh, because the perception in our community is that people are violent. Um, and, and the only reason that anyone would want to carry, open carry, um, would be, for, for just my opinion, that they fell under attack or if they felt that they need to intimidate somebody or, or prove that they are going against uh, the reality of, of someone else's perception. So that, uh, and, and the waiting period uh, of 10 days, and here's the reason. As I've listened to, to Councilor Donald Ferring and um, other teachers in, in our district, we have a real mental health almost crisis in our uh, middle schools and high schools. The pandemic has been really hard on the kids. There's a lot of talk about suicide. There, um, it doesn't take much for someone who thinks they're badly in love to be told that the person doesn't love them and they go into incredible, incredible depression. If they're thinking along those lines at all, I think it's also called the cooling off period. 
that before you can actually get a, a, a gun, think about it. Give yourself some time. Uh, perhaps someone's working with you and, and would help you out of that time period that seems so dark and ugly to you. So um, I, I am very much the wait period and for the open carry. Um, I also think very strongly, very strongly that I understand that the Second Amendment says that you have a right to bear arms, but it did not define the arms. That was made in the 1700s, and pitchforks were considered a uh, something to arm yourself with. Um, because it hasn't been defined as to what an arm was, it's been interpreted very differently. And 2022 is very different from, from the 1700s. Uh, with all of our technology and the way we can purchase a, a firearm and the type of firearm we can purchase. That for me, watching from the time that we did this open cafe talking to everyone about the arms, Moms Demand Action, from gun rights, and it was a very good community effort. We have escalated totally in the number of killings of children and adults and events. My job, the way I see it, is for the, the protection of the health, safety, and welfare of our residents. And I feel like that right to bear arms has crossed over into my ability, to our ability to protect people because it's too wide, it's too undefined. Um, so that's why I want some stricter regulations, if nothing else, to tell the state and Congress that are now looking at different different regulations. We agree. We need to move forward and address this as people who have issues. I don't know what they would be. I don't even know if it's a illness. Um, they're murdering people, and we need to address that in our country. We are now a country that is at war with itself, it seems to me. Um, it has nothing to do with handguns, with the right to protect yourself in your home. And, and that's what I fear going forward if we don't make a statement to our residents that we hear you, we understand, and we just want you back when are ready to support, when are ready to on the books where Congress is going to have our voices heard that this is a huge problem that will not get any better if we don't speak up. So, um, you should tell a pretty passionate about that. So, uh, that's where I am. Um, Chief Artis, do you want to uh, address the, uh, the enforcement piece that has been brought up? Um, thank you, Mayor Beck and council members. Um, I made a list here of items that, that you wanted to discuss. Um, I think from an enforcement standpoint, when we talk about that, we really need staff, myself, and Gene, to really need direction from the council as far as what we're talking about, as far as what we're talking the past. For us to be able to look at that and do some research to determine whether or not that's even enforceable and what our capacity is to do that. So until we have a, a good understanding of what it is that council Unit wants to see. Only then can we make it an educated, an educated answer to what you're Thank you. That gives us a lot of insight on what we need to do. So I want to make a suggestion. Oh, I'll go ahead and talk to you. Um, I would uh, like to ask Mr. May to verify. Um, I believe that the if, if I understood this correctly, the General Assembly gave us very limited enforcement powers in terms of local regulation in particular. When we start talking about open carry, uh, you can give a $50 citation and ask them to please put it away, um, which is you know, not very strong uh, deterrent, in my opinion. You know, I don't, I don't, Put it in your trunk, and then the next weekend they'll be back out there again. Um, so you know, that that is, um, you know, I, I think what we've heard about here. Um, you, there are only two things that we're likely to be considering at all: 
a waiting period, which is uh, not something that you would really enforce at all, I don't think. You know, that would be the um, the stores. Uh, um, Automated systems, if I understand it right, the same as, as automated background check. So, I, I think what you're referring to is concealed carry. No. So, concealed, well, let me, not. you did talk about the $50 civil penalty. I believe that, that applies to concealed carry. If you would take that firearm to a civil carry, you would not allow carry. Oh, I, could, I could be wrong. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you can have the concealed carry permit and you can have it. I am, and it's uh, you can as the attorney here. It, it is the new legislation that SB 21256, and they are talking about uh, the first offense or ordinance restricting concealed carry. May not impose a fine that exceeds fifty dollars, and may not include a uh, jail sentence. Does it give us the ability to restrict open carry at all? This was, we're, we're, we're not, I don't think anybody is really worried about people who see carry permits because they're registered and they're trying to make out permits, you know, and they don't scare you. So, can I just interrupt? Unless everybody weighs in on that to say, I don't think anybody has a problem with it. Just, re just your opinion is. Okay, well, uh, th th that is actually not the point. My point was that Eugene was talking about concealed carry, but those of us who have weighed in have weighed in on open carry. And so what, we are, what, what, what our question is, is what penalties may be uh, levied for to discourage open carry? Because my reading of it was, it was the same. It was, you know, live away and here's a citation. Uh, currently, we do have uh, local ordinances that regulate open carry. Yes. And, uh, they would be subject to the penalty under our local code. I am looking that up right now. So while he's looking at that up, the, the restriction on open carry right now right, is city buildings yes what else we can expand that i know i know i just i'm just what right now okay the constraints are you can't open, uh, open carry here right you can't do it in the justice center you can't libraries, do the library recreation centers um any city owned building is what we can extend that to if it doesn't if it isn't there now any public in public places or yes yeah these gatherings of and I would uh, question open, uh, outside swimming pools, uh, city owned pools, um, anything where the public can gather as a, a service from long run to public. But the state statute gives us much broader authority than that. Well, to, to public places, to gatherings, uh, to, to events, I think. But that's where you know, I've been trying to solve it. I just need to for the, in terms of what the. What the so, open carry uh, has no specific penalty, so we default to the general penalty, which is a fine of up to $500 and imprisonment up to 90 days. Okay. What's it say about the weapon? What? Could you, could you restate that question? Well, it could you no. Know, it could be confiscated. It could be you know you could have ten minutes to get it out of sight. Um, you know what, is, what does it say about if you are opening, oh, if you are carrying in a place where open carry is prohibited and you are stopped, what happens to the gun? Uh, the ordinance doesn't address that. Fascinating. Okay. So, to the uh, point that you made, uh, Mayor Clinton, about what is an assault rifle, in that 235 pages we got, it was pretty well, in our fact, it was pretty well defined um, as to what a rapid fire 
fire for us, or a rapid fire, fire for heaven. It was many, 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 many types. And I think, basically, from my um, interpretation, that he could have been on the magazine and how many bullets could be fired from what type of magazine. On the rounds. Well, there are handguns that can fire equal amounts and hold equal amount of bullets in a magazine as right. So that's why, yeah, and, and as Canada has done, they've gone the other way and they've enacted regulations concerning handguns and not rifles. Um, I believe that the shooting of King Supers was not technically a rifle, it was technically a handgun that was modified. And so that's why, you know, I think. It needs to be specific as to types of, of, of weapons versus, you know, a, a legally, you know, that seems vague to me, term. Whatever it's worth, the term that was in that resolution, which was soundly criticized, well, it was, was military. Yeah. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the case was made, well, who defines military? I mean, I, that was language I put. My response was the military. I don't know. Well, I mean, that changes all the time in technology. Well, and but it keeps you out of this debate mm -hmm. about the, the weapon used, as I understand it, uh, was not an assault rifle. It was a, it was a, uh, a semi-automatic handgun of some kind. The other thing that I would uh, put in a resolution that would have this council wants to go, would be uh, changing, making the age to purchase uh, firearm the same across the board. It's 18, no, I'm sorry, 21, if I understand for any guns, and 18 for any other type. I won't even say what time. Um, I would like them to be 21 across the board um, so that it's just not in dispute. You just raise the age to 21. With a 10 day waiting period, um, cooling off period, and signage that every time we have an event, uh, if if we can in fact ban open carry in the event, or concealed carry in events that we publish, for example, and I don't know about this, but it has to be, it has to come from Eugene, but if we have big events like, um, uh, you said you said concealed. Do you, do you mean concealed? So I I want that to be researched. I, I don't know, but I think rather than discuss it here, it, I would like it to be researched. Can we cool. just pause there for just before we send somebody up to do some research? If we were going to enforce a concealed a prohibition of concealed carry anywhere. But let's say it's how, how would you do that without a metal detector and staff by and that it, and I for me I just want to research at this point. Can we even do that? What would be the um, enforcement period? Is it just so onerous that we wouldn't even consider doing it? And has anybody else done that? I'm going to ask a question. Um, if uh, the question I would like to ask those council members is why we would consider trying to limit concealed carry, except in specific places where there's an obvious reason for it, like in the courthouse or in the council chambers. Um, we already do it in the camp in the courthouse, um, and uh, you know. Mostly people who are doing concealed carry uh, have reasons for doing so that I don't necessarily agree with, but they're not very scary. Um, and uh, so, you know, I know that nobody has mentioned concealed carry. People with concealed carry permits have already been through the permitting process. Um, open carry is different and dangerous because first of all, you know, the weapon is in your hands, second, it scares people, third, it invites confrontation, 
but there are many more reasons for prohibiting open carry than there are for prohibiting concealed carry, in my opinion. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it makes the most sense to ask that of um, our public safety force. And there, you know, there are two questions. One is, you know, we regularly have people carrying assault-style weapons uh, on Main Street and whatnot. And if we were to police that behavior, what would the impact on public safety force? We don't have the answer now, although I wish you would. Um, but uh, and <coughs> our the allowable penalties a sufficient deterrent. Because if 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 both of those things are not true, you know, why care? I hate unenforceable laws. So when we go back to the council we need to give direction to staff. And um, as far as what do we want them to do, what do we want to do? And that was all part of having a pre session so we can just lay it out on the table and actually discuss where we want to go. What I heard is that um, open carry, we would like some um, a resolution or whatever we decide on open carry, waiting periods. I would like the age to be 21 across the board. Um, signage. What does that mean? Well, it just means that wherever it is restricted to uh, have got it on every every signage, on the library, any other place that is a recreation, wherever we decide it should be for the whole, it should clearly be safe. We really we updated all those signs um, after the King Super shooting because I went around all the public buildings and looked at the signs to see if they um, were visible. And a lot of them were so faded you couldn't hardly tell if they were, so we fixed them. And, uh, um, but I believe in the Boulder statute, it means that you have to put those signs up talking about the dangers of gun ownership any place that firearms are sold. Which I, I just I can imagine the creative response to that that we would have here in Long. Does it doesn't seem any different to me than putting the dangers on the pack of cigarettes? <laughs> so <laughs> that's what's happened. happened so. Yeah. Yes. I, 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 um, I just wanted to change the image of Kelvin Martin's question for the fear and enforcement. Just on the surface level, it's much easier to enforce the concealed here, simply because you can see if, it, if it, the city council or community is deciding to pay it over here, then that's easy to enforce because you see the violation. Obviously, yeah. that's that. Simply if you see someone speeding and then it stops that individual, so you can still take part of the information about the council. To answer your question, just on the surface level, uh, open carry would be easier to enforce because you can see that. Sure, and the follow-up question is, if you've got stuff to feed on the street, um, you've got some open wrecks, um, if we were to begin enforcing open hearing violations, um, I think we would want to hear about things like uh, how many officers are going to be diverted from an emergency response because they're engaged in an open hearing uh, interaction or something like that, uh, would there be a recommendation that be willing to increase the number of officers on duty at any particular time? Um, things like that, because you know, we we want policing to work, right? You know, and and so if we're going to give the police a job that they didn't have before, then um, we want to make sure that they are set up for success in doing. So I, I, that's that's what I would like to see um, come back to us in, in addition to just, I mean, yeah, it's, I, I think several of us came to the conclusion that an open carry prohibition, because it is inherently lawful, is something that we 
could conceivably address. So the, the, the question then becomes, how much is it going to would it cost us to address it? And, um, and you know, are there unintended consequences that that we haven't we haven't said? Because I got some letters that said, please do this. You know, please ban all this, adopt all these measures, so that my children will be safe. And I don't think that most of these things will make their children any safer at all. Um, the lack of open carry, you know, uh, phasing out open carry is a cultural thing. It's about the only one I can think of that would have any effect at all. So you're saying open carry would be on the news? That's the, well, that's, that's the only one I think would be effective. If all the council wants to, cons wants to consider other ideas, I am not necessarily against considering other ideas, but, but my analysis of this is that open carry prohibitions are the only ones that will make any difference okay. in law. So, and why would you think that maybe the lane of open off carry would not be effective? Because there are six gun stores within a 10 mile radius of Longmont, and only three of them are in Longmont. Weld County is never going to uh, increase the age limit. They're not going to impose a waiting period. They're not going to do any of that stuff. I, I would be real surprised if they're very thorough about doing background checks, even if they're required by law. So uh, I want to just make a statement. We're not, we're not discussing anything for Weld County. It's just long locked. Of course and not. But but if, if if right across the street it's not enforced, then our enforcement's here. Are the only thing they're gonna do is put on merchants at a disadvantage without changing the availability of the public uh, you know, to immediate access to the That's I would like to know what are the uh, so for anyone who violates things that are already Law. You know, we heard about the $50 fine. Or, uh, uh, but so it's really minimal. What can we do as a municipality to create harsher punishments for people who are, you know, who don't have their guns locked up? You know, I think about the Silver Creek incident. I mean, and that was like among the speakers that we were all like, freaking out. We had kids to go there, we had <laughs> but with their, um, you know, it was. Looking at our, um, the child acquired a gun that wasn't his to have, it wasn't locked up, in my understanding. What's that? It was locked up. It was locked up, so he was able to access it. So then what, what can we do in that situation? Like what kind of laws could we have had that would have prevented something like that? There's already a lot of things like you look at our so, from so, the state. From the state. So then they did not have it appropriately. They had it blocked. I mean, there's always ways to get it. Okay. So, but it's locked up. I think the safe storage law is, yeah. is one of the good things that's happened. Right? Yeah. The required reporting of stolen firearms is one of the good things that's happened. That, that the state, our state like other legislature has done. That said, no matter what state, doesn't matter what we do, there are times where, the, where a law does not change, prohibits well, somebody's that's, bad behavior. That's, that's why that's part of the when my daughter was suicidal, we had the gun out of the house. It was on the other side of the continental divide. I didn't even want it near us. Well, However, that, that said, she could you, have accessed it something by other means. But the uh, law requires now firearms to be stored. No. There's one of the cultural things that that we could do, and in fact, I'm not sure which institution is doing it. Um, you know, somebody is giving away from the congregational church. Yeah. Congregational yeah. church, thank um, you. Uh, and we could uh, reinforce that by by promoting other charitable activities to make um, proper storage for firearms more ubiquitous in homes, have people go home from the hospital with, with a, a, a gun case just like they do a, a car seat. You know, there, are, there are many things that Long Island as a municipality could do other than regulating firearms 
um, that that money can in fact be helpful. My understanding is that the uh, district attorney's office is handing out gun laws in this gun show. So I was looking in the library that they brought uh, augment them with uh, a number of blocks in there. So, that's, there's a, there is a high, you know, high level of interest in activity to get, that, get the <coughs> tools out there to help you comply with that law. And then other things encouraging or not rewarding, but you know, having things, you know, if you see something, say something. If you have concerns, you know, us as mandatory reporters, I mean, if you see something, we report it in the first pass. Um, because that's, you know, the teachers of what we're required to do. For other folks, for students, we have the safe to tell. You know, those avenues where there has been reporting can be that way. Um, what can we do as a municipality to look at a mechanism that, or or how could we bring out to a broader, um, you know, have it be created in our culture, it's meaning that if we see something or something that is right or we have concerns, where can, where can we go to report? In just a streamlined fashion, not kind of going with this convoluted chain of phone numbers and being transferred as they want. Um, but what can we do in that respect? And would that be something that is more effective in preventing? I don't know. I don't. I don't know what the answer. That's not a simple answer. But I. But I think that's a question that needs to be answered. Yes. I, I think we ought to challenge ourselves to say to the people, with the people in this room, with faith leaders in this community, with service club leadership in this community with our business leadership in this community to say this is important enough. Just if we could just do that, right? It's important enough that we need to, to elevate the level of discussion. Um, and, and then let's see where it goes in terms of what are the, the artifacts that come out of that, the protocols um, that, that uh, send real clear messages to the community that when you do see something, here's how it's easily and seamlessly shared with people who can intervene prevent a catastrophe. I just think um, whatever we do here uh, is no doubt important. I'm not understanding the importance of things we've talked about. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about, Susie, are the things that are going to ultimately make a big difference in my opinion. And, I, and you know, what we did back in the fall of 2018 is a, is a place to start or not. I'm guessing if we brought the community together, gave the community a chance to have the same kind of conversation, my guess is we find the same four areas of common and, you know, and I do want to continue this work. I do I do want to have open lines of communication. Something that isn't helpful is, oh, I don't know, oh, I'm going to take you out, or whatever emails that we got, and I'm like, well, that doesn't really elicit yeah. wanting to have any kind of open communication. For me, you know, I'm coming in with this open mind, looking at all possibilities, because maybe what we thought was the answer, in the end of the discussion, we might have come up with something that we didn't really think about coming into the discussion. So that's what, what my hope was in having this conversation, being able to come out of something, co coming out with something that will address the problem without, you know, without just, okay, these were what I wanted to do, this is what I want, this is my agenda, this yeah. is my plan, but really having an open mind to, to come up with realistic solutions. This is the second thing, I don't know this, because I have not had this conversation with anybody in this but it's secondhand conversation. The district attorney has reached out to several gun owner or gun store, gun dealers, right? gun, like the owners of gun store stores and sell guns, uh, and asked if they'd be willing to work with the district attorney on on what can they, what can, how could they be part of the solution? So whether it's waiting periods or whatever might come out of it, I, if we if this whole initiative inspires that. Then I think it's a big step in the right direction. But regardless of what we do, or in addition to what we do, I'm not saying we're not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. But I think we ought to encourage, we ought to, we ought to invite that part of our community to the table and listen and figure out where where is the common ground we can find again right, on the kinds of things that those folks who are every day dealing with the sale of ammunition or firearms can do to be part of the solution, and, and how far they're willing to, how close they're willing to come to meet interest in whether it's this council or others. So, um, Carol, is there any way that she can be working or did she just listen? Uh, I'm not sure. I think she's on training. Okay. So, um, 
So I consider the discussion that basically what you're saying in terms of the water is what we did in 20, you know, revisit what we did in 28. Or somebody come up with a better idea. I'm just saying ordinances, maybe there may be new ordinances like over here are necessary, it's certainly not sufficient. Oh, of necessary and sufficient is to say, what's the cultural issue? It's like trying to solve homelessness. But yeah. unlike other communities, we ought to be at least taken on. I agree. I, mean, I don't think we can ignore that, that we're well not going to be the next problem that scares me to death. And well, the best example. And what did they say to our community when they said all you did was talk? You know, um, there's, there's no no action taken. What did you do for me? You know, that happens in one of our schools or at our at our uh, events or. I, I would be ashamed to be honest and to say, no, we talked about it in four years. I mean, so what do we want to do going forward tonight? Do we want to, uh, what kind of direction do we want to give to ourselves? Do we want to put in some of the things that we've talked about to have given direction to research? back to us in a resolution or in an ordinance, plus uh, a, a community engagement uh, forum to set up an, an engagement forum with community gun owners, uh, whoever. Um, my problem, problem with that and my frustration with what we did in 2018 was that there were a lot of people there, I would say maybe an eighth of the people that were there were not from Walmart. And that, that bothers me because they bring their perceptions of their character from what their city would do. And I think, well, that's great, right? Well, I think we start to start with a different question. I learned to replicate what we did there. But I think the methodology is a pretty good one, but let's come up with a different idea. I, and to have the point is, is to is to is to not end this with whether it's a waiting period, open period, whatever, but to say this. I agree with you on that, but I don't think it should ever be an issue that we don't discuss ever. Um, it's not most issues in this world. Um, so going forward, when we go into the council chambers, uh, do we want to have a discussion about where we want to go with direction to staff so they know what they have to research, they know what they're what we want them to do uh, because sometimes we have all these discussions and I see Earl sitting there like and the direction is <laughs> so do we have to wait I and mean, this is a public meeting and we're not passing any ordinances can we just say what our directions are well I'd rather do a council meeting on the head follow the agenda is it on the agenda well it's on the direction of direction for future agenda items and the whole, you know, the whole point was that we are out of the sunshine law now, so we can discuss this. No, no, I mean, we are out of, we are within the right of the law. There you go. Yeah, that's, yeah, I knew we were outside the sunshine. So I, I'm curious to know, um, okay, so all of these are listed regulations that were implemented by other cities in Boulder County. Correct. I would like to know, and you know, depending on what your bandwidth is, then, you know, no, just, I'm going to research five, we can do five max, but, but I would like to know, I mean, what are the implications of all of these things that were passed? You know, I would like to know more as far as, you know, do you know, get your coffee, but, um, you know, I would like to know, you know, what are, what are, what is realistic for a municipality to pass? Is it enforceable? Is it even legal in a larger scheme federal and state law. Well, I know the state law gives us the you know, rights to, to do that, but what, what would be the conflict with our uh, federal law and constitution um, through the whole list? So could we, um, 
we needed direction to staff could that be part of the direction that yeah that but i would like to know like if this is going to make them all fall over on their chair up or oh all over okay. yeah. most of it's actually going to be eugene okay. most of it's actually going to be on the side yeah. okay oh so eugene Mayor Council, so is the Second Amendment is yeah. a significant research project to research all of those issues. And, um, you know, we have limited resources. If that's what Council directs, we will certainly do that, but then we won't be able to devote resources to other priorities at the city, like attainable housing or other things that are going on in my office. So, um, my recommendation would be to research those things that council is most interested in um, rather than doing a comprehensive review of second amendment law uh, i would have something to add to that um, not that i know anything about anything more than that than a well-informed lay person about constitutional law especially the second amendment but um i did talk to some uh, office holders in other municipalities, and they said, well, we really didn't consider the implications of enforcement. They just passed what the state said in the past. So we may be the only municipality that is seriously concerned about doing things that will have a positive impact on the community and not doing things that will have a negative impact. And that would be my reason for focusing on things that we might actually do. Well, I would love to have our deputy air chief of the city weigh in on the impact of that before we decide you know, he's going to tell us this, the impact of these things. Once we decide what direction we're going to give at this point, we don't, we have to be the direction to do anything. I just discussed this. Uh, so my question is, do we want to move forward with direction or is this just a conversation? And the, uh, I guess I'm trying to get what the question is. Um, is it, what's the impact to public safety? Well, we, well, depending on what we are asking you, to research. I don't know how he will know what his answer would be because he doesn't know what, what we want him to look at. Yet. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think the hard part, I don't exactly jump in here, but I think it's the more we understand where you want us to start, exactly. what you want us to look at, then I think it's easier for them to then say, here's what the impact is going to be. Because if you did everything, there's obviously going to be some impact, but you're going to have to quantify it based on the totality of what you all are directing. So I think the more clarity we have, I think they can come back with some answers. And that's what I'm trying to get some clarity. I want to be able to do. Um, okay, in fact, the council back to the check for one second. I, I've just been making some notes as council members have talked. Kind of what I heard this evening is that I knew the public area, the public area. One of the one qualities that I guess the four cities have done in the past. Uh, but what I heard was that we were originally, uh, it's more questions about this in the Kirk, kind of what the city could or could not uh, pay in a certain area that I think they're going to help us. But then open carry, what is the information about open carry also about how that impacted the public safety and um, how we would be able to enforce that, you know, what those costs and the consequences cost of those things to the city. Based on whatever council decided that would look like, um, and then ways for people to basically see something, say something, to know that they should be able to provide that. Council was very talking about getting the information. We'll call to the next call on the night, getting the information, information, provide information more efficiently and effectively. Um, then I also heard about community engagement. Uh, Dr. Warner was talking about that before. I would bring those to the table and have that conversation and kind of fill it up. Again, I think that's a council decision. Um, that's something that we can really look at. And, then, um, and so I think that was, those were kind of the two topics that's concealed. Uh, 
But I think, as, as Mayor, as you mentioned, what we're looking for is, is directions of what we get a starting point to look at. Right. Because I believe that there will be more conversations based on what the council and the community wants to see. And then we'll have to start being more specific on you know, how would you address this? And what does that look like? If there's a creative little park on a venue or are you going to try to buy a firearm? But all that begins with the use of the venue to the topic, whether it's concealed carry, whether it's an open carry, open carry. For us to begin to look at that in turn as a city, as a whole, uh, and as a community, what that looks like to bring that back and then have more specific discussions with them to how we would move forward and what we need to do. Whether that would be an impact on public safety for the city as a whole or the community as a whole, and then ultimately to make a decision like that. Yeah, if I can add something, I think it's the key in the process we went through on the legalization of marijuana, but we, we got more clarity for you yeah. all. And we were able to go, here's what it's going to take from a staffing perspective. Here's how we're going to go through the process. Because several of these things may be less of an impact on public safety and more of an impact on the licensing requirement. And so it would say, you know, when, now all of a sudden when we take into account that we do liquor licensing, marijuana licensing, and if you had this kind of licensing, then we would probably have to look at a licensing for and staffing to handle some of the I'm referring to the number one same thing with all of these. If we looked at all, those are the kind of things you would start hearing from us to say, well, if you, if you have to deal with minimum age and what you're selling and, and those things, that's going to be something we're going to have to treat more like a licensing requirement, mm -hmm. which would be a little bit different. And so the more we get on the clarity, the more we can start getting all the data and we'll say, here's what you think is going to uh, I have a question on uh, waiting for the license during that time. That would be a kind of thing to do that in checks or uh, CDI or whatever. Would that be an assumption? Or you refer to the business period? Yeah. Um, and again, uh, Jeff, please, Chief Sutton, will step in and run the bureau. There is a background check that is currently done now. The fire license check is pretty quick. Uh, basically, you would pass everything by the state of the you would pass everything, you'd be ready to have to pay the purchase of that, and you'd not be able to be able to do what it takes. That's it, it's a date, so it's a decision. You would not be able to do that, you'd have to come back in 10 days, pay for that, you'd have to 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 pay for Yeah. Um, 
Um, so before you go, and then the direction to have an open forum discussion sometime in July. We've got the open forum in July. That's an open forum check anyway. But do we want one specifically about this? Yeah, we think it's fine. I don't think there's more than enough before, but you know. Our community discussion. So we'll probably engage the process of some kind. Oh, my mind. Okay. So, happy July. Um, so, so, my other. in July or. or just thinking about the two days of writing and pulling together. Um, yeah, you know what? I'll take this quickly part. as possible. Do you want to do it? Yeah, your choice. Here's my other question. Do I have here? And I know this Do we, as a council, want to make this decision about these issues that we're bringing up and uh, asking the uh, staff to research? Or would we like the the residents to weigh in on a ballot issue? Ballot So we had some doubt about that. We asked you to confirm that we could have a statue on the ballot. The ordinance. And yeah, the ordinance. We don't need for a resolution. Senator Council, you can you have required ordinances in the ballot. Yeah. yeah. So that is uh, something when you bring that back because we would have to return to that first reading. We would discuss what they want. What we told you to research and bring back per the per the motion tonight, and then we can discuss if we want to be developing or not. Yeah, I mean, I think based on your question and Eugene, John, my memory, you, the council could have two put two options to this. One, you can make the decision as the council and adopt the ordinance, or you could have a refer the ordinance to a vote. Okay. So I will make that motion and uh, it will depend upon both in a second after whether we uh, ask this to be put on a separate agenda. Or then we're going to ask the ordinance language. Do you want to bring, well, so one of the things, um, and this is pretty clear because this is all ordinance language. I don't think we need to develop this public engagement process. Everything else would be pretty straightforward. You know, I think it's interesting is what we talked about earlier, Harold, is uh, that was the, uh, the Canada law, and that was just pastors in the process um, that most of those handguns that have been used in homicides. That come from the United States. Mm -hmm. I, I find that really interesting. Which, well, this is just a little off process. I just thought that was really interesting that we are now becoming a supplier. We supply a lot of weapons worldwide. I know him. Yeah. Prohibition on the law on serialized firearms. There's a federal law that exists, but you can't enforce federal law. There's a statute, I think it's a criminal law, which is a misdemeanor if you possess a firearm with a serial number. So the part of the state law that has not adopted anything yet, it's fairly state. So, is that your civil resources? I was just going to say, are you not wondering if this is something that would like to see more information on? Same with bump stocks, right? As a federal law. President Trump had an executive order where he made bump stocks, which you know, was not very positive for his constituents either. Uh, I, remember. I don't know if it expired. I know I'm pretty confident that uh, President Biden would not have done away with that particular executive order. The, the thing about bump stocks is that they are one of a number of technologies that 
um, accelerated fire in the way of a semi-automatic weapon. And so banning bump, bump stops is kind of performative because you just use one of the other technologies to get the same result. Which is the reason that, that I'm not that excited about banning classes of weapons because it's so easy to work around that. And I'm sorry to have all of this stuff, but my in-laws were collectors of federal firearms licenses. And so um, you, you, some of it goes in. Um, so, Kelsey, the double hearing, do you want uh, those guns put on that direction as well? Yeah, it's like uh, illegal to manufacture and sell a ghost gun, but individual curtains in the federal law that they make their own components. So it's not as common, but they can't sell that weapon. Uh, if there is a sta state statute where right, you're facing a firearm stretched on the screen, and there's those kind of things. So, say that again, Jim. Somebody had to purchase a kit to build a gun. No, go. They, they have to build it themselves. They can't, you can't, without a federal license, you can't sell a firearm without surrounding a gun. They can manufacture They can purchase it. Uh, Councilman Waters asking, they can purchase the parts and build yeah, it you themselves. Can the parts and then owning, the gun. owning a gun without uh, a registration number on it is legal. As long as you have the person. Which no, becomes a ghost gun. Right. We've done criminal cases on people who do a ghost gun. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're going to come from the very expensive thing. We have done criminal cases on ghost guns. That was the selling. Yeah, you saw it. So, the, so if the feds allow that, can we? Can we? Yeah. 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 It's already, it's a simple felony. So you just have to call the sheriff's office, right? If you, if you for example, confiscating them in, in the in the course of we get we have to get the feds involved in the investigation. Oh, so even the sheriff's office yeah. can't do that. Either. So you'd have to call the FBI. Yeah. Well, we can watch. we can work with the federal investigators and get them to take the case. Okay. I've done a federal case. It's a little more work. This is a very sensitive issue. Yes, to put a future agenda, and then to bring that research. Are you going to leave the question of ordinance versus referred, or us taking action versus a referred ordinance down the road once you see what comes back to say? Yeah, you know, what do you think about this is that once it comes back on first reading, then we can pull it off and discuss the language, etc. And then at that point, either file it or approve it. And I think it's a motion if you want to do with it. I think I'd personally rather have it come back to general business and then we'll decide whether or not to put it on for first reading. I, it would be helpful to get some input from the community on the question. I, there's a part of me that thinks. If we do that, it is just gonna. This is gonna just be a, a lot of noise, right? Which is why, there. which is why I'm asking the question to be put to be a ballot. I know, I understand, and that's my point. If it's on the ballot, there's gonna be a lot of rhetoric between you know, between now and November. Uh, that would be the downside, in my opinion, that we deal with it and move on. The other side of that is there may be people in this room or in the community who, who would prefer that and would like to, you know, would like to weigh in, and I'd like to hear. So before as we make that decision, I'd love to hear from the community or those who care about this. Say do your job and pass an ordinance or absolutely give the community a chance. Yeah, I don't know that answer. Well, I don't yeah. know. We could bring it back as you know we talked to the council about bringing it back as a zero rating ordinance. Yeah. And we can bring it back as a zero rating and then we can work with public information to you about some kind of survey or component to ask that question and maybe have that information for you all if you want to do it. You can do it that way if you'd like. On a survey, um, okay. did you let me know? 
Oh, no, no, no. I mean, not right now, but I mean, like, zero readings. That's all the general business. Yeah, so we, so, <laughs> no, so, when we talked about zero readings with council, it was on a complicated issue similar to things like affordable housing yeah. ordinances, and it was bringing it back before we had an introduction where you could ask questions or may have change. Okay. And then what I was suggesting yeah. instead of the email was given a platform where people could provide their responses. We yeah. can aggregate those for you all instead of the individual okay. emails. That's really what I was thinking. Okay, so the GB or study session. Yeah, sometimes it's study session. Yeah. The next okay. council's direction is good. We'll just the next study session. Oh, yeah. Eugene may have had a heart attack. Eugene may have. Eugene, Eugene, I had a remark about <coughs> survey versus ballot. Um, you know, uh, there is a, a, I mean, it varies depending on what happened in last week's news, but there is a, a, a passion differential in terms of who's going to respond to a survey. Um, and so I'm not sure how trustworthy that would be. The other thing is about putting it on the ballot is that I think it might increase the legitimacy of the statute once it became law. You know, that I, I think that, you know, if there was a 60-40 vote that says, yeah, we really don't want open carry in this community, then um, we, have our answer. we would have our answer. And, and um, you know, then we could have a community conversation about, you know, why, why do you feel that way? Because I don't feel that way, you know, and, and we didn't really get down to brass tacks then. But in the meantime, there would be no community. Yes. And I think, sorry, it was probably a bad choice of words on my part. That public input portal to get the information that you want. And if you've got folks that specialize in that, we can figure out the best way to do it. Yeah, that's what you want us to do. Public engagement. So, let's get into our study session. Yay! Okay. Okay. Not study session.